special guest today. He is a best-selling author of the Pen Tester Blueprint, starting a career in as an ethical hacker. He is also the host of uh, two podcasts, the Hacker Factory podcast and the Philip Wadi podcast. Uh, please welcome all the way from Carrollton, Texas, Mr. Philip Wadi. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks everyone for, for joining. Uh, kind of the, the inspiration for this talk came from my time as a red team lead at a, a large global consumer product company. Because when we do things, you kind of, you work in a cybersecurity, you kind of expect this is something everyone would know. But one of the things I, I kind of discovered when I was there pretty early on is people in uh, the security department didn't know the difference between a vulnerability scan, a pen test, uh, a red team operation. They didn't really know the difference of that. So I created a single slide, PowerPoint slide, with the different, different types of assessments and uh, vulnerability scanning and vulnerability management showing the differences between those. And it's kind of funny that I really didn't dawn on me until probably a couple times back, not a couple months back or a couple times recently that I've given this talk, but it kind of dawned on me that I think the CISO of that company didn't realize what a red team was because he, he brought me in to build a red team and we'll get into the differences between that. But I got in there and uh, some of the assessments and stuff I did was kind of evident they really didn't know what a red team was. And it's kind of interesting because uh, red teaming is more, we're getting into more details, but it's more adversary emulation. And I had a director while I was there that wanted adversary emulation done against an SAP app. And you don't do red team operations against applications, but it was kind of interesting that I just recently thought about that. That was the misunderstanding was at the very top of the security organization. It wasn't just, uh, you know, the practitioners and, and management types. So you got, he uh, shared all the information with you, but at the end, I will share some uh, links and stuff from my YouTube and all that, as well as uh, my LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with me. We will have question and answer at the end of this session. But if you can't think of a question right away, then later on you can send me, send me those questions later on. So the agenda, we're going to talk about offensive security, the different assessment types, methodologies and standards, and some of the tools used in security assessments. So offensive security is assessing the security posture of technology from a threat actor perspective. And this also can be people, this also can be physical security. But, you know, we think about our environments, you're always hearing in the news, hackers breach this company or that. So if you're going to defend your environment, what a better way than to assess your environment from a threat actor perspective. And so one of the things about pen testing and other types of events of security, it also helps uh, justify the need for budget for remediation because you may have you may have a vulnerability that maybe it's not exploitable, but if it's exploitable, then you definitely need to remediate it because uh, threat actors could exploit it, and uh, and that, you know that would be bad. You know, cause the company damage and stuff. But not only financial loss, sometimes reputation loss. But it's a good way to to uh, justify that budget because a lot of times you see, and one of the biggest frustrations pen testers go through is you go pen test an organization, they file risk acceptance instead of fixing things. Sometimes a risk acceptance is warranted. Maybe it's because you're not going to be able to remediate in a timely manner. Maybe it's because it's going to require staff, new hardware and software to do this. It may not be a, a fast task, so there's needs for it, but some companies kind of use that as a reason to not do that. And a good example of why you should remediate quickly, uh, one of the companies I consulted for, we were doing a pen test for a company, it was an external pen test. They had a 90-day retest, and a lot of companies are only doing one pen test a year. PCI is requiring twice a year. Some companies may do twice at the most, but this company also paid for a 90-day retest to test the remediation. So they had some criticals, highs, and, and mediums. So we came back to do the pen test. They remediated, 90 days later, they remediated the highs, mediums, and criticals. There were just a few lows left. But between the time we came back and did the retest, a security researcher had figured out how to exploit that vulnerability. So now that low level, low risk vulnerability was now like critical or high, it was exploitable. And so by the time we come back, we retested it 90 days later. If they hadn't had the retest, then it would have been open for a year until the next pen test. 
giving plenty of opportunity for a threat actor to, to exploit it. And another example of a bad decision on not remediating something, I did a pen test once where I was doing a web app pen test. Only the application was in scope, no network. But during that pen test through a, a SQL injection vulnerability, I was able to get command line access to that system. And once I got access to that system, I was able to dump the password hash, crack the password hash fairly quickly. Uh, the password was like password, all lowercase, and the number one. <laughs> and since it was only in scope for this uh, particular system, this, this web app, I couldn't go any further than that. I couldn't try to pivot into other uh, systems, do lateral movement or, or privilege escalation because that was out of scope. Sometimes you, it's kind of limited what you can do on web apps, but they filed a risk acceptance because it was a development system. And mind you, it may be a development system, but I am sure it's on a production VLAN. So if you're able to get in that system, you could probably gain access to other systems. Good possibility they were using that, reusing that same password. It was the admin account for that system. And they were using it like as a system account. They were running XP command shell. And you know, for those of you that know, it's like a command line utility to uh, administer Microsoft SQL servers. And they had this enabled, but they <coughs> filed a risk acceptance. So this is kind of why you need to make sure you're testing frequently. You need to remediate the things that need to be remediated. If it's actually been exploited during a penetration test, you need to, to remediate it. And it's kind of uncommon to actually get system level access through a web app pen test. Because anyone that's done web app pen test will see, you can see some critical things, maybe data exposure usually at the most, but you really need to make sure that you're remediating those items and, and testing frequently. So there's different types of targets when you're doing a pen test. And so this is growing by the year. We got new technologies, you know, computers, networks, apps, cloud, transportation, physical security, and actually even people, because you know, you see the people part. Sometimes companies can have really good endpoint detection. They can have everything set up really complex passwords, but if someone has sent uh, malware through an email and you're able to compromise that system that opens it, it doesn't matter how secure your, your environment is. Someone's able to get access as, you, as that user. Same thing with the physical security. Someone's able to walk into a data center or gain access to a desktop or a laptop that's connected and logged in, then someone already has access. It doesn't take a lot of hacking skills to get into that. So you really want to make sure you're testing the people and the physical security because sometimes these are often overlooked. A lot of companies are doing just the basics. They're doing their testing required for compliance and that's it. So you really need to test the physical part. And one of the things as a pen tester, one of the things I'd always note is we, because when you're doing the report, you always list things that are opportunities as well as things that are they're doing good because you give a pen test report to people sometimes it's a lot of bad news and you want to have something in that document that's showing them they are doing some some of the right things so some of the things I've documented is companies that were really doing good with physical security and make sure to document those things or if you in an organization and they've got really weak uh, physical security controls people are tailgating and all this then that's something to report to them to to uh, recommend social engineering or a physical pen test but these keeps, keeps growing because one of the things now you're seeing now with AI, uh, the OWASP project is offering some LLM uh, resources for testing uh, AI for the large learning models, as well as there's companies out there providing security. There's actually a platform called Hunter that's a bug bounty for uh, AI. So if you ever want to get into AI bug bounty, that's a good resource. But as technology grows, we're going to get more and more targets. When I started uh, pen testing in 2012, you know, you weren't seeing, you wasn't seeing cloud as much. Uh, you know, we got so much more technologies. IoT is becoming more prevalent. A lot of more work from home stuff that are bringing in these different uh, reasons to perform pen tests. So the different assessment types. So which, while the first two are not really offensive security assessment types. So you have vulnerability management. This is your vulnerability scans. We'll get into the details of that. Vulnerability assessments. Because one of the things you'll see if you ever see the the description. For jobs, you'll see VAPT, which is vulnerability assessment pen test. And so also uh, red teaming. And when I'm talk talking about red teaming, I'm talking more about adversary emulation. And we'll get into the differences between that. The industry is really kind of confused a lot of that because they call everything red teaming that they're generalizing offensive security. So one of the things is, is it's getting to be where, I don't know that you can say it's really incorrect terminology, but something you need to dive into and and do a better job of describing. So if you're a company, you want a red teaming operation done, you need to, to you know, give more detail actually what you're wanting and stuff. 
So vulnerability management, this is the cyclical practice of identifying, classifying, and remediating vulnerabilities. And this is kind of even part of your uh, patching program as part of your vulnerability management. So this is where you're doing your uh, reoccurring vulnerability scans. And what you're doing here is really checking for those CVEs and some of those configuration errors between pen tests because it gets kind of difficult to constantly be a pen testing, which that is an, an option and really a good option if you, if you have uh, you know, the budget to bring people in or an internal team to continuously be pen testing or use some of the automated platforms that, that do that. So vulnerability management, one of the things that people don't think about sometimes is your asset discovery and inventory. Because if you don't know, uh, you know, if you don't know what you have, then you don't know what to test or protect or what to defend there. And you know, back in my days, when I was in IT from when I started out in 97, you had shadow IT, but this was someone building a server and putting it in a cubicle. Now with cloud, it's easy for people, people to spin things up and you don't have to really uh, be that highly skilled to bring things, to spend stuff. It, it may not be secure, but it's just a little bit easier to be able to go into uh, you know, a browser or go in and configure things compared to the way it used to be. I worked for a mortgage company. We had a lot of uh, these different units, business units within the company were having people come in and build access databases. But so now you have the cloud stuff. You have a lot of companies that are creating microservices for, for marketing campaigns. They spin these up and they always take them down when they're, when they're done. Another good example of the testing things and having a good act inventory is uh, one of my friends was doing a pen test for a university and they were doing this pen test because they had like a web design and uh, web development courses there. So all the students got their own website. And so you've had this school for 20 years or more teaching these classes. And so all these web servers or websites haven't been decommissioned. So you don't know if they're being properly tested. So uh, they were going back to test all these, find all these systems so they could decommission and, and find any kind of vulnerabilities. So the asset discovery is really important. You see a lot of tools out there that are taking advantage of this. You can do, uh, if you have like a vulnerability scanner, like the Tenable products in Nessus, they actually have a host discovery feature in there. So you need a good inventory and, and keep up with that inventory because not always, IT is not always gonna update what new systems they brought online when someone gets a new laptop or a new desktop, those aren't always being documented. So the next phase is the vulnerability scan. So you're running Nexpose, Tenable, uh, Qualys, whatever vulnerability scan or your organization has. And then you're doing the remediation. This also includes patching. So patching is part of the, the uh, remediation or part of your, your uh, vulnerability management plan. So you, you wanna make sure that you're doing that with your program. And then repeating, you wanna make sure that you're, you're co consistently repeating this. Because you know, every you know, patch Tuesday, there's, you're opening up more vulnerabilities out there and the threat actors and security researchers are looking for those patch Tuesdays and trying to figure out how you can get around the, the remediation for those items. So vulnerability scanner is a piece of software like OpenBOSS, Nessus, and Nexpose, and Nuclei is a good command line one. But if you're wanting to, if you're getting into security and you're wanting to learn about vulnerability management, and a good step, a learning step is to learn how to use something like Nessus. Because you know you see the OSCP and they're not really using vulnerability scanners in it, but you know, one of the things some of these, these uh, education products overlook is the fact that if you're a pen tester, you're gonna be running vulnerability scanners and if you know how to run a vulnerability scanner, then you could be on a vulnerability management team. It's kind of like a, a step towards pen testing if you're wanting to be a pen tester. So this automates the process of detecting vulnerabilities. At one time, you didn't have vulnerability scanners, so you were dealing with things like using port and service scanners like Nmap, trying to manually discover these vulnerabilities. And so fortunately, they got vulnerability scanners to be able to scale to do what we need to do. Because if you've got thousands of servers to test in your environment, doing this manually just doesn't make sense. You have to have some kind of automation. And vulnerability scanning is just one of those things that's kind of helped uh, automate what we're doing. Even other uh, pieces of software that's helped help uh, further the scalability is like your exploit frameworks like Metasploit. And then you see some people are starting to do more automation around these things, which are making helping scale people more, scale more. There's some people that are purist hackers that think vulnerability scanners are cheating or these other tools, but you really have to do it because when you're talking about assessments or pen tests, it's referred to as a time box test. You're only got a limited amount of time to test and you need to be able to do as much as you can. So vulnerability assessments, so vulnerability assessments, 
is kind of the next step above your vulnerability scanning and your vulnerability management program. With this, you're looking for the vulnerabilities. You're not only finding the vulnerabilities, you're also validating these vulnerabilities because a lot of your vulnerability scanners will find false positives. And so using a secondary vulnerability scanner, you can help find those vulnerabilities as well as doing different uh, manual techniques and using other tools. Metasploit is good about finding and re remediating some of these or, or actually validating some of these vulnerabilities. And one I use a lot to validate is NMAP. Usually NMAP has an NSE script that you're able to go through and find some of these vulnerabilities because <coughs> any of these critical uh, vulnerabilities come out, they usually write an NSE script so you can quickly scan your environment to see if you can find any of these vulnerabilities. And so it's interesting too because you, along the lines of the false positives, you also can find some false negatives, things that have been missed. So if you're using other uh, vulnerability scanners and manual techniques, you might find something otherwise that you didn't find. So this step is gonna be a lot better at finding true vulnerabilities than vulnerability management, doing your vulnerability scans, but it's definitely something necessary. So pretty much like this, uh, you follow a lot of the same similar steps, although you're validating and doing some manual testing. So penetration tests, the next vulnerability type. So this is similar to vulnerability assessments, uh, but you're also not only validating the vulnerabilities, if those vulnerabilities are exploitable, you do your, your uh, analysis across those vulnerabilities and see, you know, necessarily whatever vulnerability scanner you're using will tell you typically if it's exploitable, what it's exploitable with. If it's not, then you do, you know, go to exploit DB and look up these particular versions and see if they're exploitable. Then you attempt to exploit those vulnerabilities. And one of the things about this phase that it may show up, and this is one of the reasons you want to do a uh, pen test, because you may do a Nessus scan, there may be a mitigating control. You, the CVE may be showing you it's exploitable, but maybe there's something, a mitigating control, the WAF is configured a certain way, maybe there's a firewall or some type of mitigating controls, certain permissions to prevent the exploit. So you really have to attempt to exploit it to see if it's truly exploitable. And so uh, this is kind of one step within that process once you validate those vulnerabilities. And one of the things with pen testing, because we'll get into red teaming next, but with pen testing, you're looking for all the vulnerabilities that are exploited, exploitable, exploit those and document them. And also you're going to do steps after that, like lateral movement, privilege escalation, data exfiltration, just seeing if you can get access to certain types of data. So the... Uh, Different pen test types are black box, also known as blind pen test. This is more of a threat actor approach. This is more of what a hacker would do. They don't have, you know, they don't have a statement of work and a scope for the pen test. It's up for them to find all the targets and do the reconnaissance. So this phase is going to require a lot more reconnaissance to uncover the details of those systems. Just like you're doing the pen test, you're doing your your vulnerability scans, your reconnaissance. You're looking for vulnerabilities, seeing if they're exploitable to see if you can get, get a foothold in there. So this type of testing is gonna take a lot more reconnaissance and a lot more effort. Gray box is kind of the next level down. This is a detailed scope. So this is IP addresses, domain names, URLs for the applications. And this, this type of testing, you've got everything that's there so you know everything that should be tested in scope so it gets tested. Some things could get, get uh, missed on the blind pen test. And so white box, also known as crystal box or assume breach, this is detailed information, so this could be uh, diagrams on the environment. This could be source code, because when you're doing a web application pen test or application pen test, you should really do static code analysis and source code review, because that's one area where you can find vulnerabilities. So you need to be testing that. And you also want to test authenticated, because there may be, maybe no one can break in from a threat actor approach, but what happens is someone has authorized access, because some applications that are open to the internet, if you, you know, like a social media account, you're able to register for that, get that account, there doesn't have to be any approval, so you got access to the system. You might not have able to broke in, break in from a, a black box perspective, but once you gain access, there may be things you can do. So this is where the uh, assumed breach and authenticated pen tests are helpful. So applications, you wanna do all different levels of access. So just something from a basic user up to admin, because there's some information that admins don't need to see, like credit card information, uh, PII, social security numbers, that stuff doesn't need to be exposed. So getting in and testing that. So out of the three of these methods, this one tests more thoroughly. So I'd even recommend if you're doing this approach, try to see if you can break in and get a foothold 
you know, at the beginning and then continue on with this more thorough method. But they're very important. This is like when the hardcore hackers think it's cheating, but you really want to thoroughly test the system. So red teaming, so red teaming, this is uh, using techniques, tactics, and procedures to emulate real world threat actors. So this is actually more, this is actually adversary emulation. So with a red team, uh, you're doing your reconnaissance, trying to gain a foothold in, but you're trying to be quiet because uh, you always hear people talking about a paint on the pen test trying to go undetected. You may do that as part of the pen tester for a short time, but typically that's not the goal because as I mentioned, <coughs> pen test is a time box test. So you're limited on time. With a red team operation, threat actors have months, years to try to get into environments. And sometimes that's how long it takes them to get in. And so emulating a threat actor, you need more time. And especially one of the reasons is you're trying to be quiet. Another thing about this with the pen test, people know the pen test is going on. IT groups, security groups know what's going on. So they know it's not malicious activity. If something breaks, they can report it. With a red team operation, you have a control group. And the control group is like the CISO, maybe a few others, because you really, some cases, you don't tell the blue team manager because, or the IR team, because then all of a sudden they've got a heads up. They don't want to look bad. They may tip off their team. And so you don't let them know. And one of the, the things about this, one of my favorite descriptions of red teaming was from, from Wirefall, the founder of Dallas Hackers Association. And this quote was, the, the red team tests the blue team. So you're not only testing the technology with a pen test, we're testing the technology. Although when you get into social engineering, you're, you're testing people. But with red teaming, you're testing the people, the process, and the technology. Are people following their instant response plan? Is there an instant response plan in, in place? And one of the best results I ever heard of a red team operation is this company had an IR firm on retainer. So if they ever got breached, had something suspicious, they would reach out to the IR firm, they would come in and investigate. So by the time the CISO found out about this during this red team operation, the IR team had already been brought on site investigating and he's, the CISO said, no, this is a planned activity. But that's perfect outcome. Even if they got a foothold in an environment, it was seen and responded to and blocked because there's some cases you can't block for every scenario, but you want to make sure that you're responding. And so this is like the perfect thing to do. And it's, if you think about this as almost like some of your, you think of uh, disaster recovery and business continuity uh, plans where you run these exercises to test to make sure your, your plan's working. Just like with your backups, you periodically test backups to make sure you have good data. This you're also testing the, uh, the teams to make sure they're doing things right. And this is a good thing to, to do afterwards to go back and review it and see where there are opportunities for improvement. In some cases, some company may not have an incident response plan. So creating incident response plans. So here's kind of a comparison of the different assessment types. So you can kind of see over here, they, they pretty much all have some kind of asset discovery, uh, which vulnerability management would call more asset discovery, but it's really truly kind of a constant. So reconnaissance, you're, you're also doing across vulnerability assessments as well as pen tests. You're doing reconnaissance across red team, but you're trying to be a little more careful with that quiet. With your vulnerability scans, you're running vulnerability scans to find vulnerabilities, in map, uh, any type of tools like that to do discovery look for vulnerabilities. And you also do that pen test, but you're using more quiet methods with, with uh, red teaming. In a lot of cases, you're depending on uh, phishing emails, social engineering, sending you know malicious payload to someone to gain access to that environment. A lot of times you hear about maintaining persistence, and this is one of the areas that's more important to maintain persistence. As a pen tester, if you've ran your Metasploit uh, exploit against a system, you gain access, you lose access, sometimes it requires being rebooted, but with it, you know, as a red team operation, you're emulating a threat actor, you can't go tell the sysadmin or whatever, hey, reboot the super server for me. So you're using C2s, your command and controls to maintain that access. And you know, C2s really make it easier to get connection back because uh, some of my experience with C2s, I've had instances where I had to reboot my Linux server and then I was able to quickly reconnect, whereas if it had been uh, some other manual exploit or, or metasploit, you have to go back and exploit all over again. And you're really wanting to be quiet and undetected. And so these last two, you actually have exploitation and post-exploitation. And post-exploitation, you can test data exfiltration, uh, privilege elevation, escalation, also uh, accessing data, because sometimes as pen testers, and a lot of us all go through this, you're more concerned with getting domain admin or root and not focusing on the crown jewels. So one of the things that you want to focus on is making sure that you're 
you're doing that. And just going through and looking through the data uh, is very important. So we got some someone here that uh, that's, that's one of their main hacking pieces or methods that they do is going through looking through shares and finding information and finding credentials of developers and and maybe make it easier to get in. So on to the methodology. So one of my favorite standards is the penetration testing execution standard. And one of the reasons it's my favorite is probably the most recently updated, but it's also created by people in the industry, some of the experts, some of the people that are writing tools that run very well-known boutique pen test firms, like for instance, Dave Kennedy from Trusted Sec, Carlos Perez, which is at Trusted Sec, but whenever he contributed to this, he wasn't at Trusted Sec, uh, John Strand from Black Hills Information Security Group, uh, Joseph McRae, Chris Nickerson from Lyris Consulting, another pen test, boutique pen testing firm. So this is not just based on research, because one of the areas, you can do research on security or different items, and it's kind of easier to figure out, but unless you've done pen tests, and working in the offensive security area, it's kind of really hard to guess what needs to be done there because one of the mistakes I see people outside of the, the area of security trying to speak on pen testing that's never done it is they're saying you gotta go undetected and some of the, the uh, recommendations they're given are just really not in line with, with uh, how things really done in the industry. So this, is, this gives you all the different steps of a pen test, the pre-engagement interactions, intelligence gathering, threat modeling, vulnerability analysis, exploitation, in post-exploitation and remor reporting. And so you can find this at this URL right there. So I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, it's kind of dated, I think it was last updated in 2014, but methodology and a lot of that stays the same. There's a technology section that will show you the different types of tools to use for Wi-Fi pen test and the different pen test types, as well as this, the pre-engagement section is really good because it really, it's even good for you if you're getting pen tests done. Uh, they talk about setting the goal for the pen test because even though you're doing a pen test for compliance, you should, the overall goal should be to be secure, work in compliance to that. So post exploitation techniques, uh, this is like your lateral movement, trying to go from one system to another. A lot of times password reuse, this is a way that threat actors and pen testers alike are able to gain access to other systems, privilege escalation, trying to elevate your privileges from you know, a system account, uh, you know, a, uh, lower a uh, standard user account up to NT system authority, domain admin, or root if it's on a Linux or Windows, a Linux or uh, Unix system or Mac, and then data exfiltration, and just and then accessing the data just in general, because sometimes you see these breaches in the news and they seem like these elaborate hacks, and someone just found an open S3 bucket, so it really didn't take any elite hacking skills to do that. So this is one of the things you need to test on, on your pen test, looking at the types of data that's in there, and data exfiltration, this is a kind of good exercise to test, but make sure you're not using real data. Create data that's structured like a credit card number or PII without using actual data because then this is actually an incident and a breach itself if you, if you do that. So web application, web application pen testing. So one of the best resources out there is the OWASP. So they have their testing guide, uh, also the OWASP top 10, API top 10, as well as now they got stuff for LLM, IOT, so they're constantly coming up, there's projects listening up for new tools and types of testing and the, the most popular vulnerabilities. And when it comes to the top 10 on OWASP, one of the things to keep in mind when you're testing systems, it's not about just testing the OWASP top 10. The top 10 is basically what's popular at the moment, the most common. You wanna make sure you're testing for other types of vulnerabilities. And then far, as far as the tools go, port and service scanner, so Nmap is one of the more popular ones. Mass scan is widely used, it's a little faster. Uh, but you have to be careful with it. I actually was doing a pen test for an airline once, and we were having to do segmentation testing for PCI. So Nmap just wasn't really going fast enough, so I thought, hmm, I've never tried this mass scan out, so I'll try it. So I thought, well, 5,000 is good, 10,000 should be even better. And so I ended up rebooting a couple internal firewalls. So that got me uh, being babysat the rest of the pen test. They had someone sit over my shoulder, which I thought would be off. I don't mind. I've had instances before I worked at the company in IT, we were having IT problems, and your manager's over your, over your back. Is it fixed yet? Is it fixed yet? You just don't like that. So I was really dreading it, but got in there and the guy that was working with me really loved pen testing, hacking, loved going to DAF CON. So we really hit it off and made a friend. So it made it a, a good situation. I thought it was gonna be bad, but still run into him sometimes at Black Hat, but uh, you have to just kind of be careful with some of the stuff. But a lot of times that's a fine too. You shouldn't you know, reboot a firewall because of uh, you know, a scan. In some cases it gets documented in pen test reports as a vulnerability because it's vulnerable to denial of service 
And some of the scans that you do with Nessus and even Metasploit, they will show you where the systems are vulnerable to denial of service. So vulnerability scanners and exploit tools. So exploit tools, Core Impact was one that was very popular, still around. Exploit Pack is one of the newer ones, but Metasploit is the one that does offer a free version. So through my career, I've actually had access to Metasploit Professional, but it's interesting with consulting companies, they're making money off these tools, but sometimes they don't spend a lot of money in tools. And I've worked for companies, corporations, as an internal pen tester where they had Metasploit Pro, but I got so used to using uh, Metasploit Framework that I just stuck with that. But if you're going to learn one, but it is a good way to learn things the more difficult way. So then when you get the privilege to use the better commercial tools, then it makes your life easier. And so command and control, you can use this in pen testing. It's become more common. Sometimes people refer to Metasploit as a command and control, but it's, uh, for me, it's not, I really don't really consider it so much. It has some of the same functions, but really it's more your, your cobalt strike and, and those type of tools that are. And then vulnerability scanners, so you have your network vulnerability scanners as far as web app vulnerability scanners. The pro problem with the web app vulnerability scanners are DAS dynamically. Uh, application security test tools. Uh, one of the problems with them is they find a lot more false positive than your, your typical vulnerability scanners. So when I was working for a company consulting, we were using WebInspect and got away from WebInspect because sometimes you would spend more time trying to validate false positives because one of the things you run into, especially like on uh, Apache web servers, they have this mod rewrite file. So anytime these certain configurations may be across other servers too, anytime you send a a packet to it or you know trying to test something it'll respond back regardless so it'll set there and keep running so your scans never stop so we went to uh, using the vulnerability scanner with the Nessus which has less false positives but the interesting thing about trying to test the other things it's a lot easier to automate network pen testing because people finally figured out how to automate pen testing but not web app pen testing there's still no one out there yet that's automated it so it'd be interesting to see because with web apps you can have the same application ser server, same development language, all that could be identical. It could be the same exact app doing the same function, but it could be written totally different. Sometimes uh, developers want to create their own authentication instead of using existing authentication mechanisms out there, but it just makes it that much more difficult to, to test. And so this is my uh, social media accounts and stuff, and as well as my, my podcast information, so feel free to connect. And we can open it up to questions, but if anyone has any questions afterwards, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and, and send any questions probably. Yes? So you mentioned uh, a loss for LOS. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about anything that you've seen with red teaming around LLMs or Gen AI. Um, just what have you, because it's still, you know, companies are still building out AI. Every day we seem to be getting notifications like, okay, so we're going to be using this type of Gen AI, we're going to be using this quick language model. Can you just talk a little bit more about what we're seeing, red teaming and LLM? Yes, a lot of people are using it to create different scripts, but one of the things when it comes to, to using chat GPT or something like that, you have to know something about the subject. You may not have to be an expert, but sometimes it can give you back information that's not correct. So you have to know something about it, but more teams are starting to use uh, generative AI to do that type of stuff. So that's mainly where you're seeing it. Uh, there are some tools out there for pen testing that is using it in their, in their applications that's using uh, chat GPT. And there's some companies that are, are creating their own LLMs to be more secure and train the models to be more specific towards uh, you know, towards offensive security, whatever security type, because part of the training is all the prompts to bypass the prevention. So a lot of times it tries to prevent you from creating any scripts for hacking or, or anything like that. So some people are building their own uh, chat systems, LLMs. And also interesting too, because Jason Haddix created a chat GPT for like red teaming and pen testing. So you can go to the chat GPT store and it's one of the, the GPTs you can get. And it's more geared towards doing red teaming and pen testing, but there's also Corey Ball, the, the gentleman that wrote the API hacking book. He created a chat, G, a, a GPT that's available in a chat, open API chat GPT store for API pen testing. So pe more people start creating. So the good thing is there's people, once it become available, people are starting to use it. And just the minds, the, the spirit of a hacker in general, that's anyone that's creative, 
is building this stuff once you release it to the public to use for these different types of uh, methods, you're going to see more innovation coming out of that. I met someone a while back, the CEO of a company and one of his uh, marketing folks for a company called Uno AI, and they created a co-pilot for blue, team, blue teamers. So basically you put in there what you want to do, it kind of help, got, helps guide you, which is very important because any of us that have been in IT a long time, because anyone remember back you know, in the late 90s, you had to have access to Novell, you had to have a service, an account with them, or you know, a contract, or with Microsoft, because you really just couldn't Google and find a lot of information. Now we can, we can find that with these uh, GPTs and stuff. It's a way to, to elevate that and help you know, some lesser skilled individuals. That's kind of like some of the automation, like if, with our product at our company, we automate pen testing, so it's able to take more junior level people and scale them up quicker. But yeah, it's really interesting. And one of the things I really look forward to seeing with AI is just to see what it does on the defensive side. Because I think I see a lot of opportunity for some really good enhancements to, and new tools out there for the defensive side. But a great question. I don't know if that fully answered what you were looking for. I have Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. You brought up automated pen testing. And I'm curious your opinion on how close it is to the real thing. And um, I'm just also curious about you know, who are, who's really leading the charge in that space right now. Yeah, as far as the ones leading the space, I would say it's our, the company I work for, Horizon 3. We have a product called Node Zero and Pentera. Pentera is like one of our biggest competitors. Before I went to work for Horizon 3, I didn't think it was this far advanced. So same way they could replace people, a certain level of pen tester, it could easily replace. You take a junior level pen tester, this thing's doing things that they couldn't do. A more seasoned senior uh, professional, you, I don't, you might not replace them yet, but one of the things it is doing is it's helping them scale. And we have to be able to automate because we're, you know, you look at the stuff, all the, these environments, you figured 20 years ago, there wasn't that much technology. Now it's getting ridiculous. More and more stuff is being added and to be able to scale the capabilities. And so with some of these automation tools, you can take someone, it doesn't, it's someone with some basic experience, someone that's worked in IT or a help desk and train them how to use this tool so they can use it. One of the things I'm not seeing them do yet is find O days. And so this is specific to actual practitioners that are finding the O days. But the good thing about that is, is when you have researchers in the background, so like for instance, at our company, we've had a couple of our engineers find zero days, actually create exploits. And so this is something that we're not to with AI. It's gonna take the artificial general intelligence where it gets away from the training and it's figuring it out on its own. So I think it's a while before we're replaced, but I think with a lot of AI, really what it does is it gives the end user the ability to be more creative because it's taking care of all these redundant, boring tasks. Because as a pen tester, one of the things we dread is any time we find any SSL related or TLS related vulnerabilities, how to validate that stuff is just so boring. And a lot of those, some companies you work for may not require all of it be validated, just the sampling, but a lot of times you have to validate all this boring stuff and then you haven't had a lot of time to spend trying to actually exploit things. And one of the things it's gonna to do too with this automation is give the pen testers more time to spend on these areas that haven't been automated. So these companies, uh, you know, they haven't really figured out how to automate the web app pen testing. So now organizations can use this tool to leverage to give them more time to spend time pen testing applications if they're using AI in their environment to pen test that, test, testing their, their web three technologies and stuff like that. So it's a re really interesting area. And I know a lot of people that are uh, using chat GPD and stuff to help them personally, but it's, uh, like I said, I don't think it's replaced yet. I don't know how long it would be before, but different levels, because the interesting thing is, is whenever, before I joined the company and they were sitting there demoing the tool, you know, I was sitting there watching the command line, seeing all the stuff it does. Yeah, I use that tool and okay, this is cool because it's using this vulnerability scanner because it's quicker just to identify the host. Now it's going back and using Nmap and digging deeper. So it, the way it does it, it's not fully AI for the automation, but it does some of the decision-making and stuff is using AI, but it hadn't replaced them yet, but I think it's definitely needed to help scale like especially with the continuous pen testing. So we really need to be pen testing continuous, just like the example earlier where, uh, you know, pen test the company came back 90 days later and they had exploitable vulnerability. If they hadn't, if they're not, the company's not testing frequently, you don't know when they could be breached. I mean, because they're open like that. So uh, some companies are offering like manual continuous pen testing, 
Bishop Fox and NetSpy are some that offer, and you see PTAS, Pentest as a service, so some of these companies are offering that on a more frequent basis because you really need to do that more often and using something like AI helps automate that. So I don't know if that answers your question. But it's a really exciting area. And like I said, the thing that gets overlooked, people don't talk about much is the defensive side. So I think the defensive side's a pretty exciting area to see what they do there. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, this is kind of like a broad question, but how do you feel about the OSC? I think it's, I still think it's one of the best to have because it's more recognized. I think there's other certifications out there that would do a good job of training you, but it's the more recognized because like some of the TCM stuff are becoming more popular. Tenable actually looks for it. NetSpy, because I had a, a former coworker of mine from a company I used to consult with, he got laid off and he didn't have any certifications, pen testing certifications. So he was talking to them about a job and they told him to get you know his OSCP or PNPT and come back. So uh, it's still kind of good. It's more, the OSCP is more universally recognized. And it's even like a pathway to like the CREST certification. So this is one of the things, some people over the years that kind of downplay it and talk negative about. And some people it's because they got a competing product and they want to make it look bad. But the CREST certification is over like in the, the UK. This is like one of their top recommended or recognized certifications. And even some, some companies get CREST certified as well as with the OSCP. Uh, back when it first came out, all you had to do is, I think, take a written test and you had an OSCP and you get their CREST certification. But when you have other uh, certifying bodies recognizing something, that's a good sign. But OSCP is still probably one of the most, most recognized. Uh, you see a lot of the SAN stuff that, that are actually sometimes being recognized as well, which I don't think the, the G-Pen is an equivalent because on the OSCP, you actually have to go in and hack things. But even back to like the TCM stuff, it's, pract it's uh, practical. You have to do a pen test and stuff, so you're doing real world type stuff. I think they may be a little more realistic because they're not as limiting on some of the things you can do because in a real world on a pen test, you can use Metasploit as many times as you want to and that type of thing. So, good question. Anyone else? Yes. How long is a typical red team? How much time? Yeah, it just kind of depends. That could be months or even a year. Sometimes people work on it for a year, so it just kind of depends on the type of red team. Sometimes you know you see more of the red teams taking over some of the phishing campaigns before when it was like uh, pen testing. More companies are starting to get red teams, but that could vary in, in months or even a year. You have know, a, a yearly ongoing operation. Do you have a question? Anyone else? Yes. Uh, well, also, shout out to one of my former students. The very first class I taught at Dallas College, uh, <laughs> Alvaro was one of my students. So he was the very first class. So. <laughs> so if no one else has any questions, I guess we. Oh, yes. Just another kind of broad question. Do you feel that pentest is kind of yeah, I think so. It's just, it's, it seems like the coolest thing, and I think it's probably the one area of uh, pen testing that, one of the areas of security that it just seems super cool, but a lot of it is some of the stuff you get in there, it's not as fun once you get in doing it. I mean, some people love it. It is a lot of fun, but it's not for everyone. But it's also one of the first things people hear about when it comes to cybersecurity. You talk to anyone they think about hacking, they're not really thinking about firewalls and stuff. But one of the things I'd like to see, and, and I try to do myself, is to bring awareness to the other areas of cybersecurity, because we need those. And there's a lot more opportunities. So, I mean, you figure, you know, I worked at a large bank once, and we had probably 13 pen testers organization. We had like a thousand total security professionals. So there's a lot more uh, opportunities. But I say if it's something you want to do, and you're passionate about it, go for it. And sometimes there may be opportunities to be like on the vulnerability management team where you're just doing bone scans and you eventually get to move over. That's one of the things that we had at the bank. We had several people move over from other departments that was doing like vulnerability scanning or remediation and got to move over there. So yeah, there's a lot more people looking for those type of jobs. But one of the things I say too that'll help you in this area if you wanna do that is really work on your network and get out and meet people because uh, whenever I was teaching at Dallas College, I had people always approaching me for junior pen testers, and I would recommend other people from the community because I knew them and I knew they were looking for roles in pen testing. So just get out and make sure you're networking the people that 
do the most networking, have an easier time finding jobs. Because like for me, I was in a toxic environment back in October and uh, I resigned, I gave my two weeks notice. So I started putting feelers out trying to find a job. So I left on a Thursday and on Friday I had two offers. And that's because I maximize the networking. When you go to these conferences, go out and meet people because you don't know if they're, and not just the speakers, because you don't know who's sitting next to you is a hiring manager at a company and don't even have to be the hiring manager. They can get your resume to the hiring manager. And one of the things to keep in mind with this is with the referral thing, a lot of companies pay referral bonuses. So people are gonna be more likely to refer you than what you think because they're, they want the referral bonus, you know, cause like the company where I'm at, we get like a $3,000 referral bonus. <laughs> and then going in that way, networking, it's easier to bypass those systems, the HR firewall, trying to upload a, a resume, which never may be seen. Because I, the year I went to work at US Bank, I met someone at an OWASP chapter meeting. They worked there, they were looking for pen testers. I sent in my resume. Two weeks later, I had a job offer. Same time, I applied for Bank of America, uploaded my resume. I didn't hear back until a year later. And I was highly qualified for the job. So you can think if you're just getting started out or just not much experience getting more difficult, just trying to overcome the keywords and algorithms they use is near impossible, but you can beat that by just going out and meeting people. So I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.